but I, I just want to start by asking you how you are. Well, first of all, good evening and thank you for having me. Um, well, I can tell you I'm very close to Kiev, a matter of a few miles. Um, I'm fine. My family is fine. Obviously, nobody's prepared us uh, for this. You know, it's like basically, you know, playing Call of Duty one night and then waking up in it like the next morning. So, um, but we find we've had uh, two ballistic missiles land in Kiev, like literally two hours ago. We heard the explosions. The house was shaking. But apart from that, I mean, we're getting used to the situation. Igor, what is your sense of Putin's plans for the next days? Is, is it your sense that he wants to target and, and kill civilians? Is it your sense that he wants to take you prisoner? I mean, what, what, what do you think you're facing from Putin? Well, I, look, first and foremost, I have no doubt of what's going on. I mean, uh, people think it's uh, some sort of a way to kind of build uh, back the USSR or something like that. But no, for President Putin, undoubtedly, this is a war of genocide against the Ukrainian people, the people who are the thorn in the side, the people who uh, kind of are living proof to the Russian people and to the people around the world that, you know, there's liberty, there's freedom and there's human rights beyond the Kremlin walls. So what we're seeing now, uh, obviously indiscriminate bombardment of civilians, uh, especially in Kharkiv, because in that area that was shelled today, there's nothing of military importance in the vicinity. So that's issue number one. But also the um, problem with this genocide goes even further because I mean, we're seeing pictures of, you know, explosions and tanks and, you know, destroyed residential buildings, but there are maternity wards that are being attacked. Uh, you know, babies are being born on the subway. There are people with diabetes with no access to insulin. Uh, you know, it's the situation is horrible and it's deliberately horrible. So Russia at the moment is not acting like it's Yugoslavia back in the 90s. Russia is acting as if it were Nazi Germany back in 1940s, low, basically last century. So it's terrible and people need to pay close attention to this. At the same time, I mean, I, I want to give you some cause for optimism. Uh, what Ukrainian people and what Ukrainian president have shown over the last five days is deep resolve. He, we're united. Uh, we're not going to give up. We're going to fight to the very last breath that we have, not only for us, but for freedom, for liberty, for human rights, and for the right to live in the 21st century rather than the, you know, the medieval times. And like this is our objective. And what's even more amazing is that lots of people who should have left state, for example, my family, I mean, I tried to convince them to get out because we have two small kids and my wife just said like look no this is a home we're not going anywhere you're no. the father of the family you're the husband defend but we're not going anywhere are you scared no no and this is this is not adrenaline this is just a, an understanding look i was born in donetsk so i've seen this happen eight years ago to my home city and I'm seeing a repetition of this in Kiev, in the city I love. And I know that if Kiev falls, next will be Lviv. And after that, it will be Warsaw in a few years, or Sofia in Bulgaria, Bulgaria or Berlin, or even Washington, D.C. I mean, like, look, you're dealing with a person who has no respect for any anything that makes our world civilized. So, you know, he's not going to stop. The, the only way to st stop them is to push back. And, you know, you have to kind of build up that courage to say, this is where I make my stand. And hopefully it's not going to be my last stand. And, you know, that's what people around the world need to realize. Igor, what are the Ukrainian um, military and, and the civilian fighters up against with the Russians? Are the Russians, have you heard anecdotally, you know, are they are they enthusiastic? Are they aggressive? Are they uh, demoralized? I mean, do you, do you have any um, sort of anecdotal evidence of what the fighting looks like? Well, it's it's very different. Depends on where you are. I mean, in some areas, we've seen Russian soldiers just kind of drive around the village until the uh, petrol runs out, and then kind of leave their equipment and run towards the Russian border. So, um, 
On the other hand, we've seen Chechen fighters indiscriminately shooting at everyone, including civilians. We've seen unlawful and unprovoked executions of civilians, and we've seen the likes of Kharkiv and Ektirka. Well, I'll give you one example. The reason I'm slightly shaking up, because, look, I have a two-and-a-half-year-old daughter and I have a nanny who's living with us in the house, and her cousin and her sister's husband have been killed today in Ektirka in northern Ukraine by Russian shelling. And, like, that's a daily occurrence, unfortunately. I mean, like, literally, you wake up, you call your loved ones, and you don't know if, you, if they're still alive. And we're talking about the, one of the largest countries in Europe, and the country that literally a week ago was sipping espressos and like in in coffee in coffee shops and like you know music was playing, people were falling in love. I mean, it was like it would it was pretty much like New York or you know L.A. or any other place in the world, right? Uh, but like literally overnight, we woke up in the worst kind of reminiscent situation of the Second World War. Igor, please tell her that we are so sorry for her loss. I, I wonder if you can tell me um, what your understanding is of what's on the table in the peace talks that started today in Belarus. Well, first and foremost, for President Zelensky, it's important to stop the uh, loss of life. I mean, I keep saying that both our President uh, Zelensky and his chief of staff, Andrei Yermak, they have displayed what I would call a very rare quality for politicians, uh, you know, respect uh, for human life and that humility. So uh, basically, if there's any way to stop this war without surrendering, we, we want to do that. But unfortunately, uh, at the same time, on the same plate, uh, lies our homeland, I mean, our security, our future, um, our right to choose our future. And I'm afraid, you know, would rather die than give up on that. Um, and like last but not least, I mean, I, I keep praising our president today, but you know he deserves that praise because you know, for the first time in like in Ukrainian history, we have a truly Ukrainian president. We have the president who, uh, you know, there are two types of people: there are politicians and people. You know, and he's not a politician. Let's put it this way: neither mm -hmm. is his chief of staff. And we're blessed with that. And you know, that gives us you know cause for optimism that we're going to make it through. What is his message to all of you every day? I know that he's spoken to the country every day since this started. Yeah, he just released his latest statement just now. Uh, it was a very solemn one because he was paying tribute to the fallen heroes and awarding uh, medals to our fallen soldiers. Um, but, you know, you know, Look, with President Zelensky, one nuance needs to be explained to the Western audience. Um, he, uh, the reason he's so much adored by Ukrainian people at the moment is because um, he's got that really interesting symbiotic relationship with his people. So basically, he's not making decisions. He's like literally organically channeling, you know, the consensus on the ground. So basically. He's a portrait for the Ukrainian nation, and you know that's important. So we kind of we look forward to those messages daily because it gives us hope. I mean, if he's still if he's still there, you know, it means we're still there as well. And I think that's one of the reasons why one of the main objectives for Russia is and was to physically eliminate him and those close to him. You advised him. Do you have any window into? I mean, I'm so struck by what you just said, that a week ago, um, being in Kiev was like being in, in, in New York or Chicago, having coffee, you know, scrolling through whatever you look at on your phone. And you can tell the people that ran to the subways for shelter. And, and you talked about the, the babies in the in the neonatal unit that were down there. There, there. there was a real sense that this wasn't going to happen. Here, we were describing Putin's plans to invade your country as imminent for days and days and days. Can you help us understand whether Putin is just such a menace that that's always what he says and, and maybe people didn't think it was real or why that disconnect? Well, um, first of all, I mean, like, look, I think what's happening on the ground on, in Ukraine now is uh, a, probably the best proof that Ukraine was prepared. I mean, everyone is shocked at how good 
uh, our response to this aggression was. Like, look, with war, you have to understand one thing. I mean, there's no way to prepare for brutal war of extermination in the 21st century. So you kind of, you make yourself comfortable with that idea, but, you know, there's always a glimmer of hope that, you you know, it's, it's just crazy rumors that are not going to come true. Secondly, and more importantly, I think, like, look, President Zelensky, within the last month uh, running up to the invasion, was trying to break through that wall of bureaucracy. So, like, look, the West knew what was going to happen. The West had uh, high probability understanding of what was happening. And yet this, the sanctions are only rolling out now. Uh, I mean, did thousands of Ukrainian people really have to die for the West to understand that there is no alternative to severe, you know, suffocating sanctions on Russia. I mean, the West is learning that lesson now with weapons shipments. I mean, uh, yeah. we'll fight them with our bare hands if we have to. But I mean, do we really have to? I mean, Ukrainians are at the moment are portrait children of you know, the free world. So, you know, there's this saying that Kiev is a capital of freedom now, and President Zelensky is a temporary global president of freedom. So do we really have to protect it with our bare hands, with the world standing by and just watching? I mean, that's a real tragedy here. But look, I'll leave you probably on, on, on a brighter note. Uh, some people, I mean, I've been told on a number of interviews today that I resemble Jimmy Fallon somewhat. Uh, yes. And I... <laughs> Yes, but but I've actually, like, look, first of all, now I look what Jimmy Fallon would look like if Putin ever attacks the U.S., uh, so kind of watch and learn. Um, and secondly, <laughs> like, look, I've, I've literally lost five kilos, so I used to be the chubby version of Jimmy Fallon, but I think by the end of this conflict, I mean, I'm ready to face him, you know. I'll be his complete doppelganger.